Welcome to our very first Upside Down Classroom. I totally thought about welcoming you from a headstand and then I thought like it would be really awkward to try to get out of that inversion in order to start the lecture. But in any case, you get the point that it's an Upside Down Classroom and it might be that some of you are watching this from home, maybe you're watching it prior to the lecture, maybe it's Monday of the day of our lecture, or maybe you're waiting all the way until after Thanksgiving is entirely over to watch this. In any case, we still will be meeting on Monday the 19th for our lecture, but instead of having a traditional lecture, we're going to go through homework and review and talk about really anything discussion-wise that you might want to talk about relating to the material. So let's kick things off today with a few announcements. Your, your homework number nine, which is the last full homework assignment, is due tomorrow. So remember to get that in by Tuesday night. If you're unable to do so, please make sure you've communicated with me and we have a plan for that. Please do submit your updated abstract if you haven't had a chance to do that. I don't know where all of your groups, like I should say, I do know where all of your groups are in the process, but depending upon where your groups are in the process, you should think about maybe submitting your, your revisions prior to going to Thanksgiving, just so that you, those are fresh in your mind and my feedback is fresh in your mind and, and whatnot. Um, so we'd like to try to get that abstract packet together as soon as we can, so when your group does have a chance to either make revisions visions or to submit the first draft of your abstract, please try to do that soon. Some of you will find that your groups are ready to submit your first draft of the poster, and I love to receive those whenever you have them and want that, me to give you feedback on them. Remember that the poster is kind of like a long version of the abstract. It's like the abstract was the trailer for the movie, and your poster is the actual movie. It's going to go into more depth on each one of those sections. The first few sentences of your abstract, that'll be like your whole introduction will be devoted to expand, expanding upon and extending upon that material. So it'll get much more in-depth. Um, you'll give a more in-depth methods review and, and you'll even go into great depth on your findings. So it'll just be like expanding out your abstract and making it into something a little more complete, a little more uh, full of details. So let me know when you do have a draft ready to go. Send it my way and I'll give you feedback on that. In terms of lab, if you have not already submitted your unknown report, make sure to do that tomorrow. Please feel free to bring it by to me. When I'm in the lab, I'll be there from 9 to 11, from 1 to 2, and from 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. And those are also the times that you can come in and work on your Winogradsky columns. So uh, be sure to find me there at those times and come and get some extra credit on the Winogradsky or turn in your report or whatever you uh, need to do. Of course, that's all totally optional. And some of you, I realize, are probably already, even as I speak, out of the country or wherever it is that you're going for, um, for a break. So let's dive into material, remembering that last time when we left off we were talking about phonetic and phylogenetic methods for both identification and classification of bacteria and archaea. We had just talked about a couple of really interesting ones. Um, we had summarized numerical taxonomy, which is a phonetic method of classification. So it's the ability to take all of what we learned about biochemical testing and everything in the lab and to extend that to a method of classification. So we'd spent some time talking about that and similarity, similarity matrices and what have you. We had then just moved our attention to a phylogenetic method of identification. We had been looking at probing, and we talked about how we could get a tiny little piece of a signature fragment from a known organism and label it, like make it into a probe, and then use that to find out whether the unknown DNA came from that same microorganism. We talked about, though, how it's sometimes necessary to amplify the DNA prior to performing probing. Probing. Um, and amplification of DNA can be done by PCR. So PCR is just a method to make more of the DNA and then we can take that more that we've made and use it to find out if, if maybe that organism is the same as the organism that we took the signature fragment from. We now turn our attention to another phylogenetic method of identification, 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing. So this is a new one that we haven't yet talked about. We'll highlight that. And then we're also going to turn our attention to some phylogenetic methods of classification. The first one that we'll talk about is GC content, which is a really simple method. 
We'll then turn our attention to the gold standard, DNA hybridization, which is the, the method that is allowing us to define species levels. So for Jenny, that'll get to the point where we can actually give you a method that is used to say, okay, if we, if we hit this certain point in DNA hybridization, we know that we, have, we can define this as the same species. We'll also talk about how 16S ribosomal RNAs can be compared to allow us to not just identify, right, but to classify organisms. So this gives us the big picture view as we now head into the depths and look at the use of 16S RNAs to allow us to identify organisms. Remember that 16S RNAs are absolutely essential components of critical organelles. Because of this essential fu function, they have really highly conserved region regions. We call them signature sequences or fingerprint regions. And we know that these rRNAs, and if you think particularly about the 16S rRNA, remember how that has the region that is complementary to the shine delgarno region. So that's an absolutely essential function of the ribosome, is lining up with the shine delgarno finding that start site. So it's required for all organisms. And so we don't see along the uh, all along the historical line of organisms, we don't see many changes that occur within that region. We say those regions are conserved. And so that being the case, if we have those conserved regions, if we can sequence these, these rRNAs, we have a good idea of what they are going to be by comparing them to computer databases of these, these sequences. So because of the high conservation of these sequences, the RDNAs can be sequenced to identify organisms. Now, we remember, too, that the 16S RNA is not the only ribosomal RNA in the ribosome, and all of the others are super important as well. Remember the ribosome activity of the 23S RNA? It's the one that actually forms the peptide bonds in every elongating chains, polypeptide chain. So it's also uber, uber important. The 5S RNA is another of the ribosomal RNAs that has a functional um, capacity that is essential. So when we look at these different RNAs, we have to ask ourselves, why is, all, why is everyone talking about the 16S RNA? I mean, why was it chosen to make these large computer databases for identification of unknown microbes? Why didn't we instead choose the 5S or the 23S RNA? Well, I have to tell you all, I just feel like, you know, I'm telling a, a little bit of a, a fairy tale when I say this. Um, you know, basically, this is how it went. The 5S RNA was just too small and difficult to work with. The 23S RNA was just so large and cumbersome. <laughs> but the 16S RNA, it was just right, right? And so this was the one that ended up being chosen. Because of its intermediate size, it has been the one that has been traditionally sequenced and the one for which we have created extensive online computer databases to which we can compare sequences. So we have, and many of you discovered this, when you went to do the extra credit for your unknown report, you found that there were extensive sequences on GenBank to which you could compare your sequence data that was given on the web page. So if you did that extra credit, you had a experience with a phylogenetic or genotypic method of identification to help verify what you determined phenotypically in the lab. So this is a great way of identification. Let's turn our attention now, as promised, to the GC method of classification. So this is our first phylogenetic or genotypic method of classification. GC content is a super easy way to quickly compare the genomes of different organisms. We're essentially just looking for how much guanine and cytosine are present within the, um, within the genome of a microbe. Now, we might say here too, why GC and not AT? And this is just, again, it's just tradition. But we can also know that if we know the GC content of a microorganism, we also by default know the AT content, right? So we can go ahead and say that really in essence, we're determining the content of both. So, or percentage of both. So the relative amount of A, T, G, and C can be used to compare the genomes of different bacteria. We express this as the percentage of guanine plus cytosine, or simply we say the GC content. But let's say that we do determine the GC content of an unknown organism, or maybe 
in this case, we determine the GC content of two organisms, and we want to look to see whether or not they're highly related to one another. So we could say, well, if we determine that the GC content is, say, 40%, we, we know by default that the AT content is 60%, right? So we, we know one from determining the other. You might be thinking, well, how do, we, how do we figure out the GC content? I mean, if we are sequencing, don't we just know the whole sequence and we know AT, GC? I mean, what's different about that and determining GC content? Well, GC content is a, is a much easier measurement. We're, we're actually taking the melting temperature of the DNA. And if we think that through, it kind of makes sense. If we think back to the hydrogen bonding that holds together two strands of DNA, and recall that there are three hydrogen bonds between G and C and only two between A and T. So the more GC there is, the hotter the temperature has to get before we see the melting of that DNA. So we can measure the melting temperature and relate that to, directly to the percentage of G and C. So often measured by measuring the temperature at which the double strands of DNA denature, the greater the GC content, the higher the melting temperature. We call that, that temperature the Tm. The melting temperature is T subscript M. Now, that is essentially a measurement of where 50% of the DNA is denatured. And this is actually really, really easy to measure because DNA, because of the, the bases, right, they have highly conjugated double bonds in those nitrogenous bases. And so those bases absorb light. But because they're hidden in double-stranded DNA, double-stranded DNA absorbs less light than single-stranded DNA. So if we simply watch, as we watch the um, absorbance of uh, 260 nanometers is where those bases absorb light, if we watch the absorbance go to being lower at double-stranded where they're hidden, to then being exposed in single-stranded DNA to being a higher absorbance, we can find the melting temperature. So let's show this on a graph depiction where we can see the DNA going from being double-stranded to being single-stranded. Now let's define the axes here. Relative absorbance at 260 nanometers as a function of temperature. Noting that the A260 is, is, at, is in the, on the y-axis. So as we go from being double-stranded DNA at lower temperatures, there's less absorbance of light there. Now ramp up the temperature, and as that temperature ramps up, more and more of the DNA becomes denatured, and more and more of those bases are exposed to absorb more light. So at higher temperatures, that single-stranded DNA absorbs more light. It is, um, a higher, it is a higher absorbance as it becomes more and more denatured. When we hit 50% denatured, there's sort of a vertical asymptote right there. And that's the TM. That is defined as the TM, or the melting temperature of the DNA, is the temperature at which 50% of the DNA is denatured. Now, we can directly relate that temperature, that melting temperature, to the percentage GC. So by measuring the TM, we can get the GC content. So this is not a fully informative method because we can't say that if two microorganisms share the same TM, that they absolutely have the same GC content. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth because in fact, humans and Bacillus subtilis both have 40% GC. And there's some days when I feel more related to Bacillus subtilis than other days, but um, certainly we're not really that highly related, right? So that we can't say that because two things have the same TM that, we, that, that they are closely related. But what we can say is if they have very different TMs, then they are not closely related. So we can rule out relation. This would have maybe been um, a helpful thing for Tricia the other day, and I think I'm getting this right, when she tried to identify her, unknown, her A unknown organism and thought that it might be Staphylococcus. Well, all members of the Staphylococcus species have between somewhere between 30 and 38% GC 
Um, but it turned out that what Tricia actually had was micrococcus. And micrococcus all had between 74 and um, between 64 and 75 percent GC. And so there's a very big difference between the GC content of those two microorganisms. And so if we would have looked at the melting temperatures, we could say that her, her unknown was not very closely related to anything in the Staphylococcus genus. So this is a way for us to rule out close relationship. It doesn't necessarily establish close relationship. So before I leave this behind, I want to make sure everybody is fully understanding this graph. If, we, if this is one organism with a TM here that's looking like it's somewhere around 82 degrees Celsius, if we graph another organism on the same axis and it has a melting temperature that sits maybe over here, then we could find its TM to be somewhere right around in, in this area. And that melting temperature is more like 87, maybe, degrees Celsius. So we, we could say that the organisms whose curve I've drawn in red has a higher GC content than the organism whose curve is drawn in black, right? Because the TM, or the melting temperature, is higher. Awesome. So this is a fun and easy and quick way to allow us to rule out close relationship. But it doesn't allow us to establish that close relationship. The next method that we want to look at does do that. This method is called DNA hybridization. So the extent of nucleotide sequence similarity between two organisms can be determined by measuring how well the DNA strands complement one another. That is, how well do they hybridize to each other? So literally, if we go and denature all of the DNA from two different organisms, we've got, say, two unknowns, and we put them together, all of the DNA, and we see how well one's DNA complements another's, then we can tell how closely related they are. And in fact, if they're greater than 70% similarity, we say that they're in the same species. So that kind of answers Jen's question, Jenny's question from the other day. Let's look at this in a picture form so it's a little bit easier to understand. On the left, we have the DNA from one organism. We're going to denature that DNA. So break all of the hydrogen bonds. And then affix the backbone. So the green there is representing the sugar phosphate backbone. We're going to affix that onto a nitrocellulose filter. Notice now that all of the sticky ends are, are pointing up. That is, the unpaired bases are all pointing up, ready and waiting to hydrogen bond. Now, take the DNA from another organism that we want to see how closely related they are, and we're going to chop it up into little pieces, and we're going to label it with detectable radioisotopes or fluorescence or something along those lines. So we'll label it. And then we're going to denature this DNA as well, so it's really sticky and ready to bind. Now we put the DNA from the second organism into solution in hybridization mixture with the nitrocellulose filter from the first organism. And we're going to see how much of this labeled DNA is going to stick to or hybridize with the DNA from the, the first organism. So the radioactive fragments are allowed to hybridize with the DNA bound to the filter and we let it hybridize for a while. And we let everything that's going to stick, we let it stick. Then we're going to wash off the filters and get rid of anything that is not specifically binding. So that'll make it so that we don't get any leftovers there that might not have bound to the DNA of the initial organism. So then we can see just how extensive is the hybridization. Did a lot of those little, those little fragments from the second organism bind? like extensive hybridization, or do we see some hybridization or no hybridization? And then we can tell the percentage relationship between the two. So we would have to do something quantitative, right? We would actually have to be measuring the counts of radioactivity or, you know, something that would give us an actual percent of hybridization. So from there, we can say if we get like 70%, complementarity between the, the, or, the two D, the organisms the DNA from the two organisms, then we can say that we have the same species. So we'll write that down. So the greater the degree of the hybridization, the greater the similarity.
Strains that show greater than 70% similarity are often considered to be the same species. But don't get fooled here. And this is where we come back again to address Nate's question from last time, that sometimes we see phylogenetic methods fall short as well, just as we sometimes see phonetic methods falling short. Because, for example, if we took Jen's Shigella dysenteriae and we took Spencer's E. coli, and we did this test with them, we would get greater than 70% similarity. Whoa, not only are those not the same species, but they are not even the same genus. And Spencer will tell you that his E. coli fermented lactose like mad and made gas and had a big gas bubble. Jen will tell you that although hers fermented lactose, there was no gas bubble, right? And that there were many differences phonetically that would cause us to put those two into different genera. So we see that maybe, again, perhaps polyphasic techniques would help us to get rid of some of these problems in classification. Let's come back now to where we started by saying that 16S ribosomal RNAs can be used to allow us to identify organisms. But they are also obviously used to allow us to classify them. That's what Carl Woese's three domain system is all about. The idea that we can take 16S RNAs to show evolutionary related, relatedness. We know that because they are so highly conserved over time, because they are a critical part of a critical organelle, they don't change very often. So they're tiny changes, just click off and tick off evolutionary time. And over a period of time, we see these tiny, tiny changes allowing us to show the differences between organisms and the amount of time that has passed since they diverged from a common ancestor. So 16S RNAs make fantastic molecular chronometers, allowing us to tick off those changes and see how much an organism has changed, organisms have changed over time. And to construct what Carl Woese did, a phylogenetic tree. So let's spend just a moment looking at some examples of phylogenetic trees. The type that Carl Woese constructed is called a rooted phylogenetic tree. Notice that it's rooted in that it shows a common primordial ancestor. It represents an organism from which all other organisms diverged. We could also say that the second tree that maybe took into account more things was also a rooted tree. It just had multiple primordial ancestors shown there. So as we uh, look in, at that kind of tree, which shows a common ancestor and called rooted for that reason, we could also look at a second type of phylogenetic tree called an unrooted tree. An unrooted tree doesn't show the, the ancestry, but it does show the relationships, the current relationships between organisms. So we could say that in this unrooted tree over on the right here, that organism A is more closely related to organism C than it is to organism D. But we're not saying whether or not organism A, B, C, and D have a common primordial ancestor. On the other hand, over here on the left rooted tree, we can see clearly that organisms A, B, C, and D all have a common primordial ancestor. And we can actually see their branch points from one another. We can say that B and D share a more, more close, more closely share an ancestor then do B and C, but they all, but B and C, none the same, share an ancestor. So let's write down the terms for a couple of these things. An internal node is a node that represents an ancestor of today's organism. So a common ancestor of organisms B and D. B and D are organisms that still live today. So these are external nodes that represent living organisms today. Now the branches themselves, those represent changes over time, or they may even dictate the length of time that has passed over, you know, between the divergence of one organism from another. So this gives us an idea of how those phylogenetic trees were constructed and helps us to maybe gain a bit of understanding of Carl Woese's three domain classification phylogenetic tree. From here, we're about to get super jazzed because we're about to do a full survey of the bacterial and archaeal world. And in order to do that, we need to dive into what we might think of as the, um, the sort of fully informative source on microbial life. This is Berge's Manual of Systematic Bacteriology. So let's take a moment to talk about that. <laughs> 